Thank you very much. What I would like to do is just to give you an insight into my life over the last few years, and maybe you can just get an appreciation of, of why I'm still here. Okay, my story and my presentation is entitled, When You Have a Dream, Never Give Up, because you never know what tomorrow is going to bring. And for me now as a disabled person, I look back on my life and I'm very appreciative of the life that I've had. I'd like to take you back to 2009, when as you can see, this was my Daniel Craig impression. <laughs> but life was great. For me, full-time job, you know, nice company car, racing triathlon regularly, you know, canoeing. But my passion was paragliding. And when you get that Peter Pan moment as a paragliding pilot, there is, in my eyes, there is nothing like it. Unfortunately, as you can see, this is me here. Unfortunately, two hours after this photograph was taken, I was flying just uh, among this area here when my life changed in a matter of seconds. And what actually happened, I flew into what we call a crosswind, which is almost like black ice in the air, that you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it, but it's there. And what happens when you actually fly into a, a crosswind is that your canopy actually collapses. Now, for me, flying at 40 feet above the ground, as you can imagine, was a very, very scary moment indeed. Now, when I actually hit the floor after my canopy collapsed, I didn't realize the actual severity of my injury. But to add insult to injury, when I actually hit the floor from about 40 feet, which was quite traumatic in itself, the canopy actually reinflated and dragged me for almost 80 meters. So this experience of being in a washing machine and just being tumbling and tumbling and being smashed to the floor was just an horrific experience for me, it really was. When I actually finally stopped tumbling and I'm lying on the floor looking up at the sun and the blue sky and thinking to myself, wow, that was really, really close. I'm just so lucky that I'm still alive. And then I tried to sit up. And I thought, why can't I sit up? Why can't I move my legs? Because you're trained as a paragliding pilot to unclip your harness and pull in the canopy when you crash. But this feeling of being Velcroed to the floor was so, so scary. And they say that life begins at 40. And it really did for me. So this feeling of lying on the floor while the paragliding pilots came down to my rescue was such a life-changing experience for me. So one of the paragliding pilots radioed for the Wales Air Ambulance. And as you can see from this photograph here, they treated me immediately, not knowing the severity of my injury. So after maybe 40 minutes, of treating me and stabilizing me onto this spinal board very, very carefully because I kept saying to the paramedic, I can't feel my legs. It's okay, you're in good hands. So immediately, they airlifted me off to hospital. And within maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes, I'm actually being treated by possibly the best healthcare service in the world. And I kept saying to the consultant, can you just tell me what I've done because I can't feel my legs and I cannot sit up. And the consultant said to me, look, we need to get you into the MRI. We need to get you to have an X-ray so we know exactly what you've done. Now, when somebody tells you that you've broken your back after having 20 years of enjoying sport, your whole life just washes before your eyes. And I genuinely thought that at that point my life was completely over. However, it was actually the start of a brand new life for me. It really was.
when I was actually admitted into hospital to have a spinal operation, to have my vertebrae fused with special pins. The first day I woke up after my operation and I'm staring up at the ceiling and counting the ceiling tiles. And I say to people, can you lie in bed for maybe, maybe a few days without moving? Because it's so frustrating. But for me, having the experience of just lying there, not being able to move and, and go for a shower and go for food, was very, very frustrating. But to actually lie there for 94 days, three months completely paralyzed, was very, very frustrating indeed. However, I never gave up. Because I know in my heart, one day, I'm going to pass away, whether I'm disabled or not. So for me, it was just a new challenge in life. Because we all grow up from a very young age, facing challenges every single day of our life. And luckily, and I mean this, even though I've suffered lower leg paralysis, both my feet don't work, no hamstrings, no glutes firing. The one group of muscles that did work, thankfully, in my legs, were my quads, because they weren't affected through the nerve damage. Now, luckily, because of my quads working, that meant that after five, six months in hospital, I could actually sit on an exercise bike and turn the pedals. I couldn't walk. Even on walking aids, I was really struggling. But when I left hospital, after nearly six months, I focused on what I could do and didn't worry about what I couldn't do. Because that wasn't going to change. My disability was always going to be what it was going to be. So I started cycling with an academy which actually taught disabled people to have a life. So when I actually stepped onto the bike, I didn't feel disabled. It was just a euphoric feeling. It really was. So after another six months of just training and training and training, the light bulb went off in my head. We were now two years away from the biggest sporting event on the planet, the London Paralympics. But at that point, it was just a, a thought, genuinely just a thought. My conscience was physiotherapy, rehabilitation, maybe a new life, albeit with a disability. But that was my thought, that was my feeling, to have a life. Now I think for me, going through life as a very, very active individual and growing up with this wonderful man who was known as Mr. Nice Guy, this is my dad. This was me, growing up with a great family. And my dad always said to me, you know, if you have a dream, never give up, son. But if you want your life to change, you have to change. And one of my friends spoke to me on a, a very special charity bike ride. And he said to me, are you training for the London Paralympics? I said, no, 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 no. He said, I think you should. I said, why do you say that then, Colin? He said, because you've got so much power, so much endurance, even as a disabled athlete. I think you could do really well. And when somebody says to you, I think you can do really well, that's another challenge in itself, isn't it? So the light bulb moment started 24 months exactly before the London Paralympics. I took myself off to Crete for six months training when we had a really bad winter in 2011. And I came back after completing three and a half thousand miles in you know, the wonderful Mediterranean region of Crete. To then come back and compete in a, an international time trial. To find that I was 40 seconds off the world record. I'd lost two stone in weight to make myself competitive in the cycling area. So my coach at the time spoke to British Cycling and he said, is there any chance of this young gentleman who's broken his back maybe having, you know, having the chance to, to cycle for Great Britain. And the British paracycling team said, okay, we'll take Mark away to five races just to try him out because we're one year now from the London Paralympics. I came back with five medals. They immediately shipped me up to Manchester 
because they, British Cycling, were now thinking, we've actually got a potential medal, you know, a medal hope here at home games. Wow. So I was now part of the biggest sporting organisation in the world, training for the biggest sporting event on the planet, and it's in my backyard. Wow. So the training started, the racing started, and that was my road to the London 2012 Paralympics, which was a fantastic opportunity for me. However, my dad rang me one day and said, look, son, I need to speak to you. I said, yes, of course. So I went home to be told that my dad had stomach cancer. So from this euphoric feeling to being disappointed was horrible, a horrible experience for me. A month later, I raced in the Road World Championships and won a silver medal. Three months later, I was invited to race in the World Track Championships to only be told one week before I left that my dad may not be there when I come home. He was given two weeks to live. My dad said, go to Los Angeles, son, and win that gold for me. And I did. Unfortunately, when I came back, my dad had passed away. A horrible experience, dealing with a gold medal to then dealing with my dad's funeral. But as we all know, life goes on, and it was not long to go now. Six months before the London Paralympics, training and racing as hard as I physically could not to give up. I won two silver medals in two World Cups and then was invited to the official launch to represent Paralympics GB at the London Paralympics. Wow. This dream was now becoming a reality. All the hard work was done. It was now time to perform for Mr. Nice Guy. So my first race, the sprint. Four laps of the velodrome, as fast as you can. Silver medal, the very first medal won at the London Paralympics. An amazing achievement, two years hard work. The 10 mile time trial, another silver medal, but not the ones that I came for. Because I wanted that medal for my dad. What I'd like to show you now is my race, my final race from the London Paralympics. No trouble with the gate this time, marks away, pushing into this first corner, starting to get over the top of the gear, no problems whatsoever getting away for the, this time. 12 laps of the track, and as we watch the final get underway, for the record, the bronze has just been won while we were talking by Rodrigo Lopez of Argentina, who has got the bronze. Now, let's see who gets the goal here, and watch the lights, that gives you the guidance here as we start. Tobin is down by 1.1 on the start. Now, we know that Mark has a, has a slow start, that's, that's part of his style, and he'll start to wind it up now, hopefully, just making sure that Leandro is not going to try and go for the catch. You know, he's quite quick, so he could actually try and chase him, but... I don't think there's any trouble with that at the moment, he's holding out on him. The great danger of having such a wonderful audience is you react to the audience rather than ride to your schedule or the man on the other side of the track and you sell out before the last kilometre. Now, this is a good sign, in my opinion, that Mark has got off the mark a little bit slower. Now, he's been called forward by his coach. The Greg Midford forward just telling him he's a little bit behind schedules and he's going to pick it up a little bit. Still, it's the Chinese rider reaching the opposite side of the track first. It's 1.181 the deficit now as we go through the first kilometre. And the first kilometre time, 117.611. And not a particularly fast opening kilometre here. Yeah, Liangzhu is definitely up on where he was this morning. It'll be quite interesting to see how much quicker he's going to go. And Coburn is coming back, and as always, this incredible crowd spots him before I do. He's now inside a second, he's down nearly half a second. The steamroller is in progress. 
as you know, Mark's a good time trialist. He's on the road as well, so he'll know what to do here. If anybody can actually lift this second part, Mark can do it. Here we go. As he closes in now, they're almost locked on opposite sides of the track. Mark's up. And now Mark has reversed it by two tenths of a second. The stadium roof has just gone up 20 feet as he now goes down the back straight and he's now work in progress. He's nudging it out to nearly a second. Well, I can see it along here, Mark. It's a great position. You'll know what he's going to do here. He shouldn't tire. And the Chinese rider tried to go very, very fast on him, setting a much faster time than he did this time, or a second half out in the first kilometre. But Mark knows what he's going to do. It won't be long, I think, before he'll actually have the Chinese rider in his sights. Come on, let's get overconfident now, Neil, as he comes round into the two-kilometre point here. This is at the two-third distance now, and the crowd in front of me has always blocked my view as they all stand up. 2.35 for the second kilometre, and three seconds, I take it all back, Neil. He's got the rider in his sights. Yeah, I know Mark's going to do it. I know he can haul him in. He'll haul him in around about a second and a half a lap now. we really sort of pull up on him. There he comes off that banking with a beautiful streamlined top pursuiting position here. Mark Coburn, 42 years of age. This could be the first gold medal for the Welshman. Bit of a surprise yesterday for him in the kilo, but he knows this is the one he wants, this is the one he came for. Mark Coburn, who broke his back in a paragliding fall when his wing collapsed and he fell 40 feet. That was in May 2009. In August 2012, he's about to become a Paralympic gold medalist. Look at him fly. There's, it might, he might not even reach it. Yes, it will, just about. He won't catch him in three kilometres. The bell has gone for the last lap. Yeah, the coach has given up on telling what schedule he's on. He's just pointed at the Chinese rider. Go and catch him. He's closing in rapidly, and he might just get on his slipstream as he comes off this banking into the finishing straight. He's 100 metres behind him as he lines up for the finish. The world record has just gone by, but he doesn't care. He, oh, my God, he hasn't! He hasn't! It's and a new world record as well. Amazing. What a way to win a gold medal. Second medal, you know, keep your own world record. You can't go better than that. Two world records and a gold medal from two performances today. Mark Coburn. Fantastic has got his experience. Goal Amazing feeling. To finally, finally achieve my dream. But as we all know, when you win a Paralympic gold medal and you have this euphoric feeling, they give you something else. That was the dream I had, albeit two years ago. And my feeling is that winners never quit, and quitters never win. Another feeling that you get is when you get your own Paralympic gold medal stamp. Wow! <laughs> and a gold post box. However, there's somebody missing off that picture. Mr. Nice Guy. So I leave this with you. The thought of me staring at the ceiling in hospital for 94 days proves that dreams do come true. They really do. And I think for me, now being awarded the MBE, which is a fantastic achievement, I'll take that dream and hopefully I'll see you all in Rio. Thank you very much. <laughs>